In our last lesson, we mentioned the Clergy Letter Project, which was initiated to promote a harmony between science and religion. And by science, they mean an acceptance of evolution as scientific fact. But two conclusions came out of our last lesson. First, we saw that it's impossible to read the Bible literally, especially the book of Genesis, and also hold to evolution as fact. Second, we saw that Jesus, Paul, and the other authors of the Bible read Genesis literally as historical fact. If God meant the Genesis story to be read as a myth, Jesus didn't know about it. But that brings up a problem for us. What do we do if the Bible does not support evolution, but evolution is a fact of science? How do we believe both scripture and scientific truth? Well, to start with, let's make sure we have a clear definition of science. A dictionary definition calls science a systematic knowledge of the physical or material world gained through observation and experimentation. And I don't think any scientist, religious or otherwise, would disagree with that. Science is knowledge gained through observation and experimentation. And by the way, that's why we're told that the idea of creation cannot be scientific because the process of creation is not observable. The scientific method cannot be applied. Creation can't be tested. It can't be repeated through experimentation. So strictly speaking, creation is not scientific. But you know what? The same thing is true of evolution. Because you think about it, what part of the evolutionary process is observable or testable or repeatable by experimentation? The answer is virtually nothing. Neither creation nor evolution can fit under the scientific method. Then can science tell us anything at all in the creation-evolution debate? It can, but at best, science informs us by inference. In other words, we observe what we see in the natural world, and then we make logical inferences as to how it all came to be. So let's start with some scientific observations. First of all, we'll observe a woodpecker. A small woodpecker can drill into a tree at a rate of 15 to 20 strikes per second with a force that should rupture its brain, but it doesn't. Because of a reinforced skull and specialized construction that allows the position of the tongue and the spongy tissue between the beak and the skull to work as a shock absorber. That's not creation theory. Those are observable facts. But what can we infer from these facts? Could this have been an accident of nature that just progressed over time? Well, think about what would have happened to the first birds that started beating their heads against trees without this specialized construction. They won't survive to reproduce into the next generation. Logical inference and common sense say a woodpecker is specifically designed to do what it does just like a jackhammer is designed to do what it does. Secondly, let's observe the whales. Whales are air-breathing aquatic mammals, and like any other mammals, they nurse their young. But not like any other mammals, they nurse their young underwater. For a baby whale or calf to nurse underwater without drowning, the mother has to have a specialized watertight seal that goes over the calf's mouth and a specialized pump to blast gallons of milk in just a few seconds so the calf can return to the surface and breathe again. And the calf has specialized spongy organs on the inside of the backbone to cushion the force of this blast without being blown apart. All these parts work together to make an effective underwater nursing system. Now, what can we infer from this observation? Could it have been an accident of nature that progressed over time? No, because a specialized system like this can't evolve bit by bit. It either works all together or it doesn't. You can't do trial and error underwater with only part of the system in place because baby whales would drown and there would be no next generation. Logical inference and common sense say that woodpeckers and whales are doing what they're designed to do. And those are just two of the many examples in nature, including what we saw in a previous lesson. The fine-tuning of the universe, the complexity of cells. There are many scientific observations that point us away from evolution. But we say, what about all the scientific observations that have pointed to evolution? Well, let's take a look at a few of them. In 1912, Piltdown Man was celebrated as the most important discovery that proved evolution, a transition species between ape and man. But 40 years later, it was discovered to be a fake. Parts of two different skulls with the teeth filed down and chemically stained to appear older than it was. Nebraska man was a single tooth that was also supposed to link men back to apes until further discovery showed that it was the tooth of a wild pig. Southwest Colorado man turned out to be the teeth of a horse. Java man's skull was the kneecap of an elephant. Neanderthal man turned out to be humans with bone disease instead of some sort of knuckle-dragging missing links. And Archaeoraptor, which was said to be a clear transition species between birds and reptiles, turned out to be several different fossils put together. 
Many of the historic scientific proofs for evolution have been nothing more than fakes and misinformation. Many other proofs are based on conjecture and speculation. In 1983, a University of Michigan professor published a picture of a perfectly intermediate species between land animal and whale. But all he was going on were some teeth and a few skull fragments. As more of the skeleton was found, the animal turned out to be more like a wolf or a large rat, not the perfectly intermediate species he thought it was. And yet pictures of this early whale still swim around in science books today as proof of evolution. Let's take a look at another example. Evolutionists point to Darwin's finches of the Galapagos Islands as proof of evolution. And these finches do provide good evidence of natural selection at work, which is foundational to the theory of evolution. During the dry climate conditions, the birds with the larger beaks did better at finding food, which means that they'd be stronger, they lived longer, and they'd have more breeding opportunities. So birds with larger beaks trended in following generations, and we'd say, well, that's an evolutionary progression. But the problem is that as the climate changed again, the beaks tended to go back down in size. Rather than seeing a steady evolutionary progression, we saw a fluctuation of natural selection within the same type of bird. The beaks evened out, and the birds stayed what they've always been. You cannot prove evolution using only partial information. But don't we see proof of evolution in geology? Well, here's how geology figures in. For evolution to be true, the Earth needs to be really, really old because evolution is so gradual, it needs hundreds of millions of years to work. And to prove that the Earth is really, really old, we need to find some really, really old fossils. Now, one way scientists calculate the age of a fossil is by what strata or rock layer they find it in. But then how do they calculate how old that rock layer is? By what fossils they find there. That is called circular reasoning. You assume what you want to be true, and then you use your assumption to prove what is true. But we say, aren't there other methods to determine the age of the rocks? Well, there are, but those methods don't always tell the whole story. For example, there are volcanic rocks that we know from observation were formed only in the last hundred years. But by conventional testing methods, these rocks seem to be millions of years old. And we say, well, why is that? When rocks are formed under extreme conditions like volcanic action or high pressure from liquids, their properties are different, and they can fool these testing methods. But we say, why would these rocks have formed under hydrological pressure? Well, there's this little issue of a global flood that we see in Genesis 7. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. And rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. You know, that kind of a flood is a better explanation for what we see in geology today. About ten years ago, a National Geographic publication said, For a long time, scientists believed that the Grand Canyon was carved out slowly over millions of years. Scientists also thought that the canyon had finished forming 1.2 million years ago. But new research has turned both theories upside down. Geologists now think that the Grand Canyon grew in quick, violent spurts from massive flooding of the Colorado River. And you know what? This is not coming out of a creationist magazine. You see, the more we observe geology, the less we see millions of years of gradual development, and that does not help the theory of evolution. As non-creationist author Robert Locke says, research is consistently making the problem worse, not better. So, from our knowledge gained by observation, which is the essence of science, we can come to a logical inference of how things got here. And logical inference says that nature gives more evidence of design than it does of evolution. And much of the theory of evolution has been built on conjecture, partial information, misinformation, and circular reasoning. The foundation of evolution is not good science. But we say if that's really the case, then why is evolution the dominant view in science today? Well, there's a very good reason for that, which is what we'll look at in our next lesson.